Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, very happy to start us off on the update from the Swarm team. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about, um, well, what Swarm is, just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, what the status of the Swarm project is, and also where it's going. We've got some new sub-projects. It's going in different directions, and the, the general um, scope of Swarm has grown, and uh, so we're going to talk about where we're going. But I'm just going to start you off with what is Swarm to make sure we're all, you know, understand each other. You probably know Swarm, just a network of computers, share data in a decentralized way um, to give us peer-to-peer you know, -peer decentralized storage with all the benefits that come from, um, for, for, from being a peer-to-peer -peer network, such as resilience against network outages, DDoS attacks, and the rest. Um, but um, what you may not know, it's really the same connections as Ethereum. So same with an asterisk, because right now Swarm Client is still separate, but the vision is that it's part of the same package of protocols that would run over dev P2P, so your, Swarm no your ETH node could talk, the ETH protocol or the Swarm protocol, um, all of the same connections. So it's really tightly integrated with Ethereum. So let me give you the basic first use case, the sort of baby example of what Swarm is for, um, the decentralized storage of app data. So the blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain is great to store um, critical information about your DAP, maybe username registrations or something like that, but your DAP still needs images, HTML, JavaScript, and all the rest, and right now you probably need to host them on a server, and Swarm is there to allow us to have this in a completely decentralized way. So here's how that would work. You'd go into your Swarm-enabled browser and type bzz, which is a Swarm protocol, the name of your dap.eth. Then the Ethereum name service would turn that name.eth into a hash. So the ENS record has an address field where you can store your wallet address, and that's what address would get paid if somebody sends payment to that name. But the standard ENS resolver also has a field called content, and in that you can store a hash that's referencing content on Swarm, for example. So you use this hash of content to query your Swarm peers for the data, and in return, they will supply the data to you. And anyone who supplies you with data that you want, you compensate them using Ethereum-based micropayments, and then the last step is to just use that data to render your dApp. So the hash gives you integrity protection. You don't care where the data comes from. You know it's the right data and gives us a serverless, completely decentralized way to host and run dApps. So that's great. So let me also tell you what's happening under the hood. Um, on Swarm, when you have a file or any content, uh, Swarm is agnostic to what the content is. It's going to take anything you throw at it and break it into little chunks, about four kilobyte each. Um, and the hashes of those chunks are collected into a Merkle tree. Everything is Merkleized. And the root hash of that Merkle tree is the ID of this file or this content in Swarm. And the chunks, they're all being sent to different Swarm nodes for storage. What's really happening is that the hash is the ID of the chunk, and every chunk gets stored with whatever node has an address which is closest to that chunk hash. So really spread out the data, and uh, your, your DAP data is uniformly stored throughout the Swarm network. The nodes share um, uh, services with each other. It could be uh, data, chunk retrieval, and uh, serving data, or other services. But So the accounting, how much you have to pay, how much you get paid, is done by this so-called swap. Um, so here's how that might work. Suppose node 2 is asking for a DAP, and node 1 happens to have the chunks in question and gets to serve them. So, you know, like that. It's my own animation. I'm proud of that. Um, and if there's more than one chunk, both nodes keep count. So that might be two, four, six. After a while, if node one is not consuming any data, node two is doing all the consumption, node two will have to pay node one. So 
it would use our um, checkbook payment contract to send a check to node one. At that point, the, the, the channel, we call it balanced. You know, whether it's chunk for chunk or check for chunk, doesn't matter. And when it's balanced, we can go back and continue consuming services. So what's happening is in, within the swarm, uh, swap channel, in the middle, we're at zero balance. Neither node owes any node anything. And as soon as services get consumed, um, the balance moves off towards one side. At some point, you're going to hit the payment threshold. And at that point, the node that's in debt would have to issue another check to the node, uh, to the debtor, so that to bring the balance back at zero. So the node's always working to keep the swap within that middle range. And if you slide too far off to the side, well, um, then uh, you get disconnected. That's the punishment, the ultimate punishment in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Nobody wants to talk to you anymore. This in-payment infrastructure that uh, Swap is a part of is very modular. It can go in many different directions. It was originally designed for uh, data delivery, content delivery, and storage, long-term storage, as described in our um, orange paper. But it's, it's become much more modular and, uh, ex and we're going to extend it. And we're talking about this on Saturday uh, in a talk called Swapsware and Swindle Games, where we describe just how, um, how this can, um, well, how it can ac accommodate all kinds of different services beyond just storage. The status. Well, some of you might have tried Swarm already. If you have tried Swarm, you've been playing around with our release POC 0.2. And that really is a proof of concept release. It's not a final release. So the, sh the, the proof of concept showed us that the basic idea works. And we've had some fun you know, hosting content and trying it out and playing with it. But the performance has been you know, really slow. We've had data availability problems throughout the network. Data hasn't reached where it's supposed to go. Um, but so as a proof of concept, it was successful. Um, and the testnet has taught us a lot. And as a result, several of the core components are being rewritten or have been rewritten uh, completely. Um, yes, and additionally, the scope of the project has grown. As I've mentioned before, um, people are using Swarm not just to host content, but um, for example, the live peer group are using it for broadcast streaming video and audio. Really cool. They're also talking on Saturday. Another project that's developed is about communication, direct note-to-note -note communication. And to say, tell us more about that, I'd like to introduce Lewis to talk about PSS. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Lewis. This is my first DevCon. Actually, um, I'm a classical pianist turned cultural magazine editor turned funding bureaucrat turned band manager turned taxi driver. And I was privileged enough to get a ride with some blockchain people in Berlin where I worked in my taxi and then told me all about decentralized consensus, war on privacy, and the looming dangers of opaque algorithmically driven societal conformity. And this brought me back to the world of computers that I've been in all my life in varying degrees. Now, I work for Jack, part of the Jack team. Jack is a company, uh, first of all, I very clumsily forgot to include the logo of Jack here, but that's the logo. They're a sponsor. We are a sponsor. So uh, Jack builds on Swarm. And we want to contribute to Swarm as much as possible, of course. And therefore, I was very excited when Victor Tron came to me and and challenged me to do the PSS work. And that's what I've been working on the last seven months. Now, uh, notice that among the things I said I was, I didn't mention public speaker, so that's why I have this. Not to panic. I will be looking at more at this than at you. Don't take it personally, please. Now, Swarm is a network of nodes. And not only that, but Swarm is a network of nodes that speak the same language. This language is communicated on top of internet protocols and is regulated by a protocol framework. In Go Ethereum, this is called DevP2P. 
Swarm nodes uses this language to find their most advantageous place in the network and to figure out who to share content with. But content doesn't necessarily just have to mean files. A message, for example, is just as much worthy of the term. Thus comes the idea, if we can use Swarm to send bits and pieces of files around, why can't we use it to send messages as well? Now, wait a minute, you might say. There is already a messaging platform in Ethereum, and that's called Whisper. And this is true. But the mission of Whisper is somewhat different from PSS. Its focus is to serve the need of total anonymity and to secure freedom of expression at cost of performance. Now, since the Swarm network is rooted, it knows that the shortest way to the final destination is, and therefore PSS can deliver messages fast and with a minimum of network load. Simply, it serves a different purpose. So this is what PSS is. It's a postal service over Swarm. Now, this sounds, sounds easy, right? If you want to send a message to someone, you just slap an address on it, and away it goes. Well, it's not quite that easy. Since messages potentially pass through unknown nodes to get where they're supposed to be, they should be encrypted so that people can't snoop on the contents. That means that the actual definition of a recipient in PSS is not only the actual address of the node, but who can actually decrypt the message. Actually, the node address in the end doesn't unambiguously define a recipient. Yes, to route the message over Swarm using PSS, you pass, it to the, uh, you pass it the message you want to send and an address to send to. But let's say you don't want to tell everybody on the network who you're actually messaging with. Now, this is easy. Just disclose a part of the address. Swarm routing will still route the message the best it can from the knowledge it has, so it will land in some neighborhood of nodes closer to the recipient than you. And as before, whoever in that neighborhood can decrypt the message is the recipient. Or recipients. Doesn't necessarily have to be only one. Now, what if we don't give address at all? This is analogous to what Whisper does. And the consequence is that all messages get passed to all nodes by all nodes. This has nothing to do with routing at all, obviously. But it might be handy in some stages of the communication, like when you send a broadcasted probe to enable a pair to send you its address, but encrypted, or to get some temporary encrypted keys that can be discarded later. Now, to make life even harder for files, PSS also employs a redundant routing. And this means that when a message enters into the neighborhood of the destination, the node that receives the message for forwarding will pass on the messages to more than one peer. This happens even if the node can successfully decrypt the message. This way, anyone trying to trace a message path through the network will have difficulty finding out where the message actually stopped. That is to say, the node not passing the message anymore are not guaranteed to be the one the message was actually for. In fact, most likely, it won't be. So, all good and well. You got the message, you can encrypt it, what do you do with it? Well, for this, PSS has the notion of topics. All messages that are sent belong to a specific topic, which could be any four-byte value, but intended to be the first four bytes of the hash of an arbitrary value. PSS provides a registration method, method to attach code to these topics. Therefore, when a node gets a message with a certain topic on it, it knows exactly what to do with it. The topic structure is the same topic structure as Whisper uses for its envelopes. Envelopes here meaning the entity that encapsulates contents in the SHH protocol. In fact, PSS actually cheekily steals this Whisper envelope to wrap messages in. In reality, all PSS does is just a slap an address on top of it, or not. The whisper envelope also provides an expiry parameter. This is used by PSS to stop messages from circulating in the network perpetually. And finally, PSS uses whisper also as a backend for encryption and handling of keys. As whisper, PSS supports public key cryptography as well as asymmetric, uh, arbitrary symmetric encryption. So any 32-byte value is actually valid as a symmetric key in PSS and can be set at the developer's discretion. So to sum up, to send a message in a 
uh, to a PSS node, all you need is a key, a topic, and an address, or not. So what exactly right now does PSS implement? The encryption, as said, luminosity control, which is a fancy word for deciding how many address bytes to disclose. We have a generic handshake module, which gives you a simple Diffie-Hellman exchange of keys in case you're too lazy to make your own. And um, the keys generated by the handshake module are valid only for a certain number of messages. That is to say, they're ephemeral. Handshakes can be optionally also left out of the compilation of GoEthereum. There is an API, of course, available over IPC and uh, web sockets for key handling, message passing, handshakes, and common supporting functions that are needed. A simple flood protection. All nodes that get the message store the message on Swarm and use the hash of the message or the chunk to determine if they've seen this message just before and can optionally uh, not forward it. And finally, you can actually use PSS with the dev P2P protocol structure that exists already, the logic. So this means you can reuse dev P2P code that's already there. This can be either integrated into the code of the node itself, or there is also a module that enables you to, use, to do this in a separate process using WebSockets as the transport layer. Now, I've probably overstayed my uh, time, I'm not sure, but anyway, there is a more thorough walkthrough of PSS on Saturday in the breakout session, quarter past two. In this, uh, go uh, through, a bit uh, through a bit more of the internals, what makes PSS tick. Um, the API will present that. And there will also be a demonstration of a chat app that's actually using PSS right now. I mean, it's not a production-ready thing. It's a demonstration prototype. Um, so, uh, and this is not only a demonstration from the screen, but actually the audience will be, you guys, <laughs> will be able to install the app and chat with us live, if all goes well, that is to say. Um, yes, so if you can't wait till then, uh, here are some links. On top is the branch where the active PSS code is now. PSS will be a part of POC3 for Swarm, so this means you won't find it in the Ethereum master repo now, it will be later on. Uh, there is a description of the API. And also, there are some code examples for both the P gener general P2P programming in uh, Go Ethereum, along with a bunch of PSS uh, examples on the bottom link there. And I think that was it. Yes. Okay. Danny. Danny, with encryption. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the first uh, Swarm-based uh, application that is aimed at a wide audience, basically the general public. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, cloud service that allows people to uh, share files between one another and also to sync files between uh, different devices. Uh, so this is, a fairly, this is expected to be a fairly popular use case. And what we hope to get out of it is uh, that we are going to see how Swarm actually performs at scale. So we are really hoping to uh, get uh, extensive analytics and uh, user feedback out of it. And also, eventually, it will allow us, the Swarm team, but also the Ethereum project in general, to sort of use whatever infrastructure we have built in order to uh, host our documentation, our source code, our web pages, and so on in a decentralized uh, and censorship resistant fashion. And in particular, uh, I was always baffled by the fact that Linus Torvalds has given us a wonderful distributed source control system, Git, and then everybody started using GitHub, which is a centralized service. It's a great service, very happy with it, but, uh, but it's centralized. And uh, there's already work going on uh, for uh, a module for Git uh, on top of Swarm. Uh, Alex Berksas is working on it. So hopefully, uh, in the not too distant future, we're going to be able to host all the uh, sources 
uh, of uh, Ethereum on Swarm and have the development repository basically be stored in a, a distributed fashion. Uh, the first thing that we did uh, in, uh, for this uh, application was a GUI-based uh, file manager. It was uh, released uh, last September, so over a year ago. Uh, it is itself a Swarm-hosted uh, web-based uh, distributed application and it allows people to manage folders and files in a very familiar and uh, intuitive fashion. Uh, it also has uh, pluggable previewers for various types of content, so you can view images, movies, and later perhaps PDF and whatever people can think about. Uh, so that's the first thing that we have built. Uh, then uh, Zahur Mohammed has uh, in this summer released a Fuse module, which means that you can actually mount a Swarm volume as a directory into your file system if you're using a POSIX compatible file system. So it works on Linux and Mac, no Windows support yet. Uh, it already has read and write support. Uh, you can already mount uh, ENS registered uh, volumes. And there's one thing uh, missing, which is sort of a safe to ENS kind of functionality where you can update the ENS resolver with the new content after you have modified the uh, content of the uh, swarm volume that you have mounted. So this is also available for download and you can, you're also very welcome to play with it. Uh, this is a big one. So currently all Swarm content is unencrypted and in the open. And this of course makes it completely unsuited for any serious use. But, uh, and this is what I am currently working on, uh, privacy and uh, security, encryption. Uh, so here you need to understand that this fundamentally differs from a uh, traditional cloud-hosted server client application because obviously you cannot force people like not to share certain information. So access control needs to be implemented in a different way. So essentially write control so who is allowed to modify something is equivalent to uh, the permission to update the root hash in ENS. So it is something that is controlled by a smart contract. A smart contract is what takes care of write permissions. Read permissions are even trickier because you know, where Swarm content ends up, it cannot be uh, controlled. It just goes all over the network. You cannot hide Swarm content. You can only encrypt it. So what you can do is you can uh, encrypt Swarm content and read permission essentially means the ability to decrypt it. And if you want to have access control lists, so you want a large piece of uh, data to be readable for some parties but not others, then what you can do is you can take the symmetric key with which this uh, data is encrypted and encrypt that symmetric key with a number of public keys of the parties that have read permission and use that as a access control list. <clears throat> and this uh, obviously affects how uh, content can be referenced. So in unencrypted uh, swarm, the standard reference to content is the swarm hash of the manifest. In uh, encrypted swarm, in addition to the root hash, you also need the decryption key of the root. Uh, how this encryption works? So uh, as Aaron has already told before me, Swarm chunks up content into small pieces and organizes them into a Merkle tree. And in Swarm, every chunk is going to be encrypted with a unique uh, key. And 
each uh, edge in the encrypted Merkle tree contains not only the hash, but also the decryption key for that particular chunk. Uh, which means that if you reveal a key at some point in this tree, so one of the uh, Merkle tree's nodes key gets compromised, it means that only the subtree under it is compromised, which is kind of a stopgap measure for catastrophic failures against losing keys. And also, it allows different directories to be shared among uh, different parties as a subdirectory of different uh, directory structures. And uh, so I would like to uh, invite Aaron back to talk about the uh, network testing framework that we have built. Um, yeah, hello again. I'm filling in for Victor, our team lead, who is here but not able to speak right now. So I want to talk a little bit about the network testing. Well, the, the full title is the Network Simulation and Testing Framework. And I have to admit at this point, I'm not the right person to talk you through this diagram in detail, but that means I'm the right person to give you an easy to understand high level overview of what's going on. So I'm gonna start from the right and talk my way over to the left. In the top right, what you see is our network visualizer. It is, um, it's a, a web-based or a browser-based view of a swarm network. So it, all those dots in there would be swarm nodes and connections between swarm nodes. Uh, this interface allows us to query any swarm node, what's its current status, store chunks, every connection, the swap connection, what's the swap balance, what are the payments, and so on. So it gives us a very uh, a great overview of a swarm network, of a test network, to see what's going on. And um, it also allows us to input changes. We can click on a node and tell it to go offline, tell it to initiate a data retrieval, whatever we want. That would take us into events. So these events we can fill into the network, sort of simulating activity on the network, telling nodes to drop offline, come online, do various things. And uh, these events get packaged into whole scenarios so we can write a network scenario of nodes coming online, sharing content, downloading content, paying each other, refusing to pay each other, whatever we want, and we can observe how the network um, behaves, like what, it, what the network does, what the emergent behavior is. In the back end, which is further towards the left, we can either simulate the swarm nodes in process very quickly, and, uh, or we could launch a bunch of dockers with various, um, so we could host a cluster of swarm nodes and, and actually run them in full, or we can just simulate them. So these scenarios are portable, so separating out what we want to happen on the network and the level of simulation, whether we just want to simulate the process or actually, you know, but there's also, we also want to have like a backend to our cluster where we can have our whole cluster of machines running a whole bunch of swarm nodes doing, um, running through these scenarios. And the reason uh, why we're so excited about this or why we're developing you know, this is um, to test uh, emergent behavior of the network. So normally when we talk about testing a client, you're running code tests to see whether a swarm node behaves the way you expect it to. But a lot of the intricacies, the subtleties of swarm arise from the interaction of the different nodes in the network, the emergent behavior, like how data is distributed. One node requests data, the other ones forward the request, the data is found, handed back, all the nodes have to do the accounting. And if you want to see how this network behaves, we really have to simulate a full network and test the network. So this testing framework allows us to do uh, protocol testing. You write a scenario, what you want to happen, one node uploads content, and then what you expect to happen, you expect the data to be handed from node to node, stored here, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So it's more than just testing an individual node, it's testing that all the parts work together. And this framework is not, is about, you know, it allows you to test PSS, storage, retrieval, the entire, you know, the whole package. And that's all I'm gonna say about this today. Um, we'll be, give more about all of this on Saturday. So, upcoming stuff, what's on the roadmap? 
So one of the things that's changing is the hashing algorithm. Earlier I said when you have a chunk of data, you hash it and that is its ID. We're changing that to actually make the ID of a chunk be the Merkle root of a Merkle tree that we make out of the chunks, out of the 32-byte segments. And this allows um, far more fine-grained resolution proofs of inclusion and, and, and proofs of custody. This is where, where that comes in. Um, then the syncing protocol has been rewritten. The syncing protocol is the protocol that governs how swarm nodes share data, how the chunks make it to their destination, and that's the one that was causing us the most headaches in terms of performance on the test network and why, if you were playing around with that, you got so many 404 errors where files weren't found because the, the data wasn't being passed on the way it was supposed to. So that's been rewritten and it will be merged soon. Indeed, the entire network layer and the connection management has also been rewritten and is ready to be merged. And these changes are breaking. So um, the ch hashes need to change, the ENS entries would need to change, and in fact, we're gonna have a complete reset of the Swarm testnet soon once these things are merged, and then hopefully we'll have a far more performant test network to play with um, from then on. Um, yeah, so ongoing work, encryption, erasure coding, plausible deniability, that is Donnie's, uh, where he talked about that, that's what he's working on. PSS is under active development, and um, yeah, the contracts for storage insurance we didn't talk much about today, but um, they were in our original orange papers and they are being developed and tested. Not, they haven't been deployed yet. All we have so far is contracts for, um, for retrieval, and uh, like the bandwidth incentives, but the storage incentive part from the orange papers is being developed too. And then the testing framework is undergoing active development. And um, then also on the roadmap, I want to highlight a few things. A light swarm node. We've been contacted by people who are doing mobile development saying you, we cannot assume that every swarm node will want to store a bunch of data and serve it and earn revenue. Some people just want to join the network and only consume very limited data that they want. You know, if you have limited bandwidth. So we talked about various light modes of operation. Nodes without storage or nodes without a lot of bandwidth. And so we've been developing the theoretical framework how those swarm nodes should fit into the network and we intend to uh, develop those two so various light modes of operation to make it easier for mobile clients and other light clients. Uh, the payment infrastructure, as I alluded to earlier, is being developed to be far more generic and to allow for, for different services than data storage and retrieval. One of them being you know, communications, broadcasts and other things service networks that we'll talk about on Saturday, and uh, Victor will also be talking about distributed database services and how they fit into both the Swarm network itself and the incentive layer. So that's, that's the update from us. Our team is Victor, Donny, Fabio, Zahur, and Anton from the foundation. And from Jack, we've had a, not just one, but two Lewises giving us great, you know, a lot of time and code, so big thanks to them. And the Swarm team is still growing. We're, we're very active development and adding people. Um, yeah, so there's even more coming. And so I want to make special uh, advertisement to our breakout session on Saturday, the session on P2P technologies, blockchains and data and communication. There'll be updates from the Swarm team. We'll talk about swapsware and swindle. We'll talk about distributed databases. There'll be a PSS update. There'll be an interactive chat demo and Updates from other teams live peer. We'll be talking about streaming services of a swarm. So a lot of good stuff. So we hope to see you there. And with that, I'm going to end a little bit early. Um, but thank you for your attention. Thank you.